Breton Rounds, episode number 114, Linkoff's Rules. Before you can repair a retinal detachment, first you have to find the retinal breaks. However, finding the causative retinal break can be challenging. In today's episode, we'll review Linkoff's rules, which can help guide you to find retinal breaks based on the configuration of subretinal fluid. Now, more than a century ago, Dr. Jules Gonan gave us our playbook for how to fix retinal detachments, and there are three basic principles. First, find the break. Next, close the break by creating some form of chorioretinal adhesion. And while other techniques have been historically employed, we currently use either laser photocoagulation or cryotherapy. And last, close the break, meaning reoppose the retina to the underlying RPE. And our options include pneumatic retinopexy, scleral buckling, and or vitrectomy. So for today's episode, let's focus on finding the retinal break. Now, before we get to Linkoff's rules, first let's take a moment to recognize the numerous contributions Dr. Linkoff made to the treatment of retinal detachments. These include helping to develop photocoagulation, cryotherapy, scleral buckling implants, the Linkoff balloon, which is a temporary buckling method, and the inspiration behind modern attempts at temporary buckling using viscoelastic agents, helping to introduce gas and PFC alpha retinal detachment repair, and of course the so-called Linkoff's rules, which are based on his seminal publication with Dr. Richard Geyser in 1971. So let's dive into Linkoff's rules, and we'll discuss some other tips for identifying retinal breaks at the end of the episode. Okay, rule number one. For suprotemporal or supranasal retinal detachments, the break is almost always within one and a half clock hours of the highest border of the retinal detachment. So you can see in this diagram a suprotemporal retinal detachment in the right eye. And the high water mark of the detachment is roughly at the 11 o'clock clock hour position. And you can see that the detachment extends inferiorly and is involving the nasal retina as well, but the fluid level is asymmetric, only rising to about the 2.30 clock hour level nasally. So in this eye with the fluid border being higher temporally, the break is most likely going to be between the 9.30 to 11 o'clock clock hour positions. Now here's another example, this time a supranasal retinal detachment in the patient's left eye. The fluid border is higher nasally than temporally, so we would expect the break to be within one and a half clock hours of the superior border on the nasal side. Okay, here's rule number two. Now this time we have a superior retinal detachment and you can see that the fluid crosses the vertical meridian, meaning we have a superior retinal detachment involving both the nasal and temporal halves of the retina. And in this case, one can expect the break to be located superiorly at roughly the 12 o'clock clock hour position, extending one and a half clock hours in either direction. Now one note here is that if you see that the fluid border is lower on one side than another, then the break will likely be on that side. So in this case, the patient's left eye, let's say that the fluid border was lower on the nasal side than on the temporal side. In that case, we would expect the break to be superior, but more likely somewhere between 10.30 and 12 o'clock. All right, going on to rule number three, here we have an inferior non-bullous retinal detachment. You can see on the diagram that the fluid border is asymmetric. Now based on this rule, we would expect the break to be on the side where the fluid border is higher. So in this patient's left eye with the fluid border being higher nasally than temporally, we would expect the break to be located in the infranasal quadrant. How about a bullous inferior detachment? Now this situation is a little bit different. For bullous inferior retinal detachments, we actually would expect the break to be superiorly located. And you can re remember this based on the effect of gravity. The bullous detachment occurs inferiorly because the superior break is allowing fluid into the subretinal space and that fluid is pooling inferiorly. If there were an inferior break, the fluid wouldn't be loculated and the detachment would likely be shallow. This is rule number four. Again, if you have an inferior bullously detached retina, most likely you have a superior break. And this is often going to be around the 12 o'clock clock hour position with fluid guttering down into the inferior subretinal space. Now there are modifications to Linkoff's rules and this is one of them. Again, we have an inferior non-bullous retinal detachment. And here, unlike the case in rule number three, we have a fluid border that's roughly symmetric. In these cases, you can expect the break to be located at the six o'clock clock hour position. Now here are a few additional tips when trying to find a retinal break. I generally like to start by reviewing a wide field fundus photo. 
This allows me to visualize the distribution of subretinal fluid, and based on Linkoff's rules, I can be particularly vigilant for a break in the area where the break is most likely to be located. Wide field photography can, of course, also allow you to visualize the break in some cases, as well as other pathology like lattice degeneration. However, it goes without saying that fundus photography does not replace a complete fundoscopic examination with scleral depression. The superior and inferior quadrants in particular are not well visualized with wide angle fundus photography, and it almost never gives good visualization of the vitreous base and the peripheral retina proximal to the aura serrata. We'll have a separate video on scleral depression, but far peripheral visualization can be achieved not only with scleral depressed exam, but also with the use of a contact lens like a Goldman 3 mirror lens. Remember that some clinical situations can be particularly challenging to find retinal breaks. Pseudophagic patients can have very small breaks near the aura, and sometimes cortical remnants or lens edge artifacts can make visualization difficult. Finding the break can also be challenging in patients with shallow fluid and a blonde fundus. Now, using Linkoff's rules can help guide you to the areas that need extra attention to find the causative break. And finally, some patients may be highly photophobic or sensitive to scleral depression. In these scenarios, it's important to remain patient, make use of topical anesthetics, have the patient keep both eyes open while fixating on a target with the fellow eye, and coach the patient on breathing as a method of distraction. It's never ideal to operate on a patient without a good understanding of the underlying anatomy, and the extra time performing a careful examination is time well spent. If a break can't be visualized, also keep in mind the possibility of a serous or exudative retinal detachment that may need additional workup. Now, there are limitations to Linkoff's rules. Sometimes multiple breaks may be present, and these rules may not be applicable in all clinical scenarios, like patients who have already undergone surgery, uh, those who have other ophthalmic diseases like diabetic retinopathy, pediatric patients, or those with posterior retinal breaks. Again, while Linkoff's rules don't replace a complete examination, it can be a useful guide to focus your examination efforts. We hope you found this review to be useful, and thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website, and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.